Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Today we're going to talk about the other kind of virus host interaction, a persistent infection. So you remember last time we talked about acute infections where rapid and self-limiting, right, they, they eventually are cleared or the host dies. Today, persistent infections are those that last the lifetime of the host. You get them and they're with you for the rest of your life. You don't get rid of them. And they're stable characteristics for each virus family or even members of a family as we'll see today. So let's say for each virus species. And in all cases, most likely a persistent infection begins as an acute infection that comes and goes and is never cleared, but the virus remains as we will see today. So back to the original slide that we showed last time. On the top is the acute infection, defined self-limiting infection. And then we have different kinds of persistent infections. So they're all persistent infections, the three below the acute infection there. They just have slightly different characteristics, so they have di different names, but they really are all persistent or chronic infection. That's another word, just something that happens for the lifetime of the host. So we have a latent infection. This is characterized by herpes simplex viruses, which we'll talk about quite a bit today. Again, the, the line is the production of virus, infectious virus, and the red is the production of disease. So you can see herpes virus, there are periods of disease and virus production, and then there are periods of just virus production as well. So it's latent because, as you'll see, the genome is present, but it's almost completely silent. That's what we call a latent infection. But really, the others are latent too because they're not completely silent, but they're still there. The second one is a persistent infection that's asymptomatic. This is very common, as you'll see today. All of you have these. Actually, all of you have herpes too, and me too. I include myself when I say all of you. I'm not trying to uh, stigmatize you in any way, okay? Every human on the planet has herpes viruses as well as these persistent asymptomatic infections where you're infected early in life and the virus just reproduces continuously. And there's some kind of detente with the host so you don't get sick unless, of course, you're immunosuppressed. And the, the mouse virus that we talked about is LCMV. And then there's a human virus. There are many human viruses. This one is JC. And then finally, and no, it's not who you think it is. It's Jim Cunningham. Persistent pathogenic viruses where they kill the host. And so you have an initial period of an acute infection and then very low virus reproduction for many years and then an end stage period of disease. And that's HIV, AIDS, of course, HTLV, and SSPE caused by measles virus, which we'll talk about today. So a few general properties of persistent infection. So again, they start with the primary infection, of course, you have to, and then the virus is not cleared. Virus particles, proteins, genomes continue to be produced. It's slightly different for each virus. And in many cases, the viral genomes remain after you can't find any proteins, as the case for herpes simplex viruses. There isn't a single mechanism that will explain persistence of all viruses, although I said a species. And what I mean by species, herpes simplex is a species of virus within the herpes family, herpes viridae family. So there's, there's no single mechanism that's consistent across species or across virus families. But in general, they start with infections with reduced cytopathic effect. Now you may remember that we said the cytopathic viruses give you the best immune responses because they cause inflammation, right? The dead and dying cells release materials that can be sensed and lead to inflammation and that gives you a good uh, adaptive response. But these viruses tend to not be cytopathic and Host, they often antagonize host defenses, and these, leads, these conditions lead to persistent infection. So all of these viruses have some kind of immune modulatory properties, some of which we will talk about today, that not only enable them to persist after that initial infection, but allow them to persist upon re reproducing and not being eliminated by the immune response. We'll see, we'll see an example of that today. So this is a table just listing the, the persistent human viral infections that we know of, there is a virus there on the 
left-hand side, and they red asterisks are viruses we're gonna to touch on today. And then the sites of persistence, you can see uh, so, some, some adenoviruses cause persistence. In fact, they were originally identified in the adenoids. That's why they're called adenovirus and, and tonsils and lymphocytes. And they seem to persist in the absence of causing any disease. But for other viruses like Epstein-Barr virus, which as you will see persists in B cells, they can lead to, that virus can lead to various cancers, Burkitt's lymphoma, Hodgkin's disease, as well as mononucleosis, right? And then the other viruses have consequences as well. So we will talk about uh, the ones here uh, with the red asterisk. A, a very important common theme among these persistent infections is that somehow they evade the cytotoxic T cell response. Remember the CTL response is very important for clearing virus infected cells. I would say it's more important than antibodies because if a virus uh, evades the antibody response and infects cells, the T cells are gonna kill the virus infected cells eventually. That's why COVID vaccines still work with new variants, unless you're very old and you have other issues that make you very susceptible. But younger people, less than say 65, they have a great CTL response. CTL epitopes are conserved. They don't vary like B, B cell epitopes do in SARS-CoV-2. So this, this response can clear the effect, infection eventually. You may feel lousy for a while, but they will work. So remember the CTL, the CD8 positive T lymphocytes recognizes antigen presented on the surface of a virus infected cell by MHC molecules, MHC1 on most cells, MHC2 on the antigen presenting cells. And that triggers lysis of the virus infected cell by apoptosis. So this is a major defense mechanism and these persistent viruses can antagonize it in various ways. So here's one summary, which we've already seen. It's modulation of MHC1. Remember MHC1 is on most cells, all cells in us, and it presents peptides from a virus infected cell. And so here we have the MHC1 molecule at the top there, uh, presenting the peptide, the little orange rectangle, and it's being recognized by a T cell receptor, which of course is on a CTL in this case. And, and if the um, T cell receptor recognizes the peptide, that means it's foreign and the, the CTL will kill the infected cell. So it's a mean, means of eliminating virus infected cells. So on this slide, there are various ways that the viruses we're gonna talk about today persistent viruses modulate this MHC1 system. So cytomegaloviruses and HIV downregulate MHC. What that means is they take it off the surface and put it inside the cell so it can't present peptides. And remember the peptides are made within the cell by taking a viral protein and degrading it in a proteasome and then putting it through a transporter into the ER lumen. And so they're inhibitors of the transporter, they're inhibitors of the proteasome, uh, and then those peptides are loaded into MHC1 and they move up to the surface and they're viruses that inhibit the movement of uh, MHC to the surface. So many ways that uh, viruses can antagonize MHC1 and that's how they can in part establish persistent infections. There are other ways as well. I just finished telling you that for SARS-CoV-2, we don't see evasion of T cell epitope. So what's a T cell epitope? That, that orange rectangle there in the MHC, that's a T cell epitope. It's, you know, it's a short peptide that is recognized by T cells. They don't change in SARS-CoV-2 from, from variant to variant. They're pretty much all the same. So our T cell responses are intact. However, there are some viruses for which we do get uh, these T cell epitopes changing. And they're called CTL escape mutants. Herpes simplex virus and hepatitis C virus are two examples. So what happens here I remember, again, the, the epitope or the peptide has to be presented in MHCs for the T CTL to recognize it. And so these viruses, which cause long-term infections, can change the peptide. The peptide can evolve. So the little green uh, polygons here, this, this is a peptide, uh, and uh, here is MHC1, uh, which is binding the peptide. And in the course of a very long-term infection, many, many years, these peptides can evolve so that they, for example, no longer bind MHC1. 
Uh, and so that they can't be presented on the cell surface and they're not recognized by the T cell receptor. So on the bottom diagram, this is now an antigen presenting cell. So this would be MHC2. Here's an MHC2 presenting an, a peptide, which is bound to it very nicely. Well, they, they're the, the T cell receptor is not recognizing the peptide. In some cases, the peptide doesn't even bind the MHC, but that's not shown here. Here, here we're showing a single amino acid change in the peptide, the T cell epitope, and the, the T cell receptor is not recognizing it. And some of these changes can also affect the processing of the longer protein, so it's not processed into peptides. Now, because MHC is so polymorphic in humans, your MHC is different from mine. So if I make a hep C variant that evades my MHC, it doesn't mean anything for you. If you get my hep C, it's not gonna have any particular advantage. It's not like an antibody escape mutant where my antibody escape SARS-CoV-2, if you get it, it's gonna escape your antibodies as well because antibodies are conserved. But, M but um, MHC and T cell receptors are polymorphic in the population. Everybody has a slightly different one. So these are personalized escape mutants, if you will. They're personalized for you because you're gonna have this infection for the rest of your life and that's where it makes a difference. So it does not facilitate population spread. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, the other thing that can happen in terms of evasion is the T cell can be killed when it's trying to kill a virus infected cell. So again, the, C the cytotoxic T lymphocyte engages a virus infected cell to kill it, but sometimes the virus infected cell will kill the T cell in return. Mm -hmm. How about that? That's really amazing. <laughs> so that's another way of evading immunity. Now, you may say, well, how, how does that work? Well, it's built into the system because once you have a lot of CTLs around, you don't need them forever. So there are processes to kill them, to eliminate them by apoptosis. And they involve ligands binding to receptors on the surface of the T cell and inducing apoptosis. So there on the right, we see three receptors on the surface. Uh, fast ligand in particular is present on the CTL and when the uh, fast ligand receptor, when the fast ligand itself binds the CTL, it will kill it because it, that induces a apoptotic pathway. So some viruses make fast ligand and they get secreted and they bind to the receptor on CTLs and kill it. So it's a great defense, right? Because it's taking advantage of a pathway that uh, is normally existing there. So I say on the slide, it's a process to limit immunopathology because you have too many CTLs around, they will cause damage. So after the virus infection is going down, you get rid of the CTLs by making fast ligand. Now another, another way that you get um, persistent infections is in certain tissues that have reduced immune surveillance. Uh, and and you know, not all our tissues are equal in terms of immune responses. So for example, the central nervous system, the vitreous humor of the eye, even the skin are devoid of initiators and effectors. So the eye in particular has high concentrations of fast ligand in the vitreous humor inside the eye. So if a CTL gets in there, it will bind fast ligand and die by apoptosis because you don't want immune responses in the eye because right, inflammation involves swelling and your eye has nowhere to go. So you don't want your eye to swell. Same with your brain. The brain is encased in your skull. It has nowhere to go if it gets inflamed. This is why inflammation of the brain is really bad because there's nowhere to go. And so the brain also has ways of damp, has very dampened immune responses. It's not zero, but it's much less. And so that, these are common places to get um, persistent infections. Also the testes are another one because they're an enclosed tissue as well and they're immunoprivileged so that they don't swell. And so you, you often get persistent infections uh, of these tissues. And again, the reason is that the inflammation, the accumulation of fluid uh, that happens during inflammation could damage uh, these tissues. So this came to light, it was just after the West African Ebola epidemic, which was uh, 2015. So 
many doctors went there from the US to take care of patients, right? And one of them was this fellow, Ian Crozier, who's a co-author on this paper. He came back to the US and he, um, he was okay. And then uh, some weeks after uh, he had recovered, he had Ebola, he recovered and he was fine. And then some weeks later, he noticed his eye was changing color. And there's a picture of it in this article of his eye, you know, it was normally green and it turned blue, or maybe it was blue and it turned green, I don't remember. So he went to the doctor and he had an inflammation of one eye and they found Ebola virus in his eye. Infectious Ebola virus. And it had always been there, you know, he had, so how do you know you're finished with Ebola virus? You survive and you, you don't have any symptoms and you don't have any more virus in your blood. That's when you're considered recovered. But they never look in your eye because we didn't know it would be there. And it turned out there is virus in the eye. So Ebola virus was detected in his eye 14 weeks after the onset of his disease and nine weeks after clearance of viremia. So he was totally fine and he was you know, here back in New York working and um, then this happened to him. So that's an example of how an immunoprivileged site in immunoprivileged sites, viruses don't get cleared. So if, you know, if people go to Ebola areas and get Ebola or people who live there get Ebola, we have to be very careful that they're not harboring virus. And in fact, the virus can also be harbored in the testes because that's an immunoprivileged site. And uh, after the 2015 outbreak, there was a flare up in Guinea in 2021 that started with the guy who had survived Ebola and he passed it sexually to a woman and she got Ebola and actually it caused a little bit of a transmission. So the way we track these viruses, of course, is by phylogenetic trees. And these are all the genomes from, these are the genomes on the left here from the 2015 outbreak in, the, in various countries, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea. And um, then there's the 2021 strains that were found in this guy and a few other people. Those are in purple here. And you can, and that, there they are right there. See, there, there are a bunch of them. So he started a chain of infection. I don't know what this guy was doing, but he started a chain of infections. <laughs> and um, they all start from a single virus, right? It's very unusual for have a single virus then branching out into all these. So it shows that he had one, he seeded one virus into the population and it diversified in, in various people. Um, so um, that is another thing we have to look at now. It turns out there are hundreds of men in uh, the, this part of Africa who recovered from Ebola who have, it's easy to check seminal fluid, right? It's easier than putting a needle in your eye and they have Ebola virus in their seminal fluid. So you have to be careful with them. Because the moment we have an antiviral to take care of that. We can, we can vaccinate though. Okay, so the other thing that happens during some of these persistent infections uh, is infection of immune cells themselves. And that further leads to persistence because uh, now you can't clear the virus effectively. And so many viruses do this. We talked about measles virus infection of antigen presenting cells. Of course, HIV infects CD4 cells as well as many other cells of the immune system. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, and others do it as well. We'll see Epstein-Barr virus infects B cells. So that can also contribute to persistence of these viruses. Which is, this is a very interesting issue. I, I wanna just say this, that we consider Ebola virus to be an acute infection, right? It comes and goes within a period of time. But now what do we call it? In some people it can be persistent, obviously. So uh, an acute virus infection can also be persistent in the right host. Our first question is, uh, which of the following are features of persistent infections? They last the lifetime of the host. Viral immune modulation is involved. Immune cells may be infected. They may occur in areas of reduced immune surveillance, all of the above. All right, let's see what we did here. That's right, number five. The fifth one. That's number five. We had four last time. I think that's the record. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I, I've never seen five. Um, we're going to go through a, a number of viruses that cause persistent infections. And this is a good example, uh, in addition to Ebola, measles virus, because it, it's an acute virus infection. We talked about it last time. Highly contagious virus, 400,000 deaths globally in 2019, all, all preventable by vaccines. 
You get lifelong immunity after infection. Uh, this is a, a classic acute virus infection, right? You have a defined period and then the disease is over, but it's not always over. And that's what makes it a persistent infection as well. So there is a disease called SSPE that I mentioned last time. Progressive degenerative encephalitis, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. And uh, this happens in kids who have had measles and they recover. You know, these are young kids. Five to 10 years later, they start to have motor issues. They can't, they, they, they walk poorly. They have cognitive issues. And then you do a diagnosis and you find that they have measles virus in the brain. They all die. They all die. They do not, there's no way to, to, to have them survive. There's nothing we can do uh, for them. So what happens here is very interesting. There's no, there's no infectious virus in the brain in, in people who get SSPE. So apparently, remember measles causes encephalitis in, in one of the thousand cases. So the virus can get in the brain and apparently it can stay there even after your rash is gone and you've recovered, you don't find any more virus peripherally. Uh, and then it becomes extensively mutated so that the, the genes are, are so mutated that you don't make any more infectious virus, but you do make particles that can spread and they have genomes in them and they can spread synaptically in the brain. So they can start in one place and move to another place uh, very easily. And we, a paper just came out, which uh, it's amazing. There's so few kids now with SSPE that it's hard to study this, but someone donated their child's brain to um, an investigator at the Mayo Clinic. And they were able to slice it up in sequence, like the entire brain in slices and they found that the virus is undergoing mutation and particularly the F protein changes so that it will catalyze fusion independent of the receptor. So normally you need receptor binding to get fusion, but now the F protein will catalyze independent cell fusion. And there are mutations in other viral genes as well. That's why they don't make infectious virus. So these particles, these virus particles are spreading within your brain. They're causing pathology, but they're not infectious. And now we're going to see more SSPE cases because we're having more and more measles in the country because parents believe they should determine what goes into them and their kids. And so now they're going to have kids with SSPE. So this is going to happen, I guarantee it, because one in 10,000, we're going to have lots of cases. Okay, uh, another virus that is in many of us are, are polyomaviruses. These are small DNA viruses with double-stranded genomes. You've been looking at a polyomavirus in this course. SV40 is a polyomavirus. There it is. This is a phylogenetic tree of the different polyomaviruses. There's SV40. And there are three genera here of uh, polyomaviruses. The, the red asterisks are the one that infect humans. Uh, there's AV polyomavirus. Uh, that's infecting birds, of course. This is, these are the Wookiee polyomaviruses that infect Wookiees. <laughs> No, actually, they don't, but they, the name is actually Wookiee polyomavirus because the first two isolates were WU Washington University polyomavirus and Karolinska Institute polyomavirus. So they called it Wookiee originally, and then they got others as well. So these are um, viruses that we all carry, as I said. You, you're infected early in life and very high seropositivity in human populations, over 90%, and many of your organs are infected. Many of our organs, kidney, intestine, respiratory tract, and you excrete these in urine. And you can be excreting 100,000 particles per mil in urines. And next time you go into a public restroom, you flush the toilet, you're inhaling someone's polyomaviruses. Can't avoid it, unless you just don't go to the bathroom. You know, that, that has other problems associated with it. But a lot of these viruses in the environment, we don't know how they persist. They must reproduce at a low level and then the immune system keeps them in check. Uh, we know this because if you're immunosuppressed, they begin to replicate more extensively and cause disease. So an, an example is a disease called PML. It's another de uh, de degenerative neurological disease which occurs in people who are being treated for multiple sclerosis. 
all right? Multiple sclerosis is an, auto, is an autoimmune disease which can be treated by giving you antibodies to B cells, basically wipe out your B cells. And in a fraction of patients, that allows um, these polyomaviruses to reproduce, and particularly in the brain, it causes a, a disease. And so then you have to stop the treatment uh, and then they, they return, but they will have worsening um, MS as well. And so if you wanna hear more about that, I talked to a physician about the, these Wookiee viruses on TWIV 250. And I just added this today because it's, it's another example of a virus that's in all of us. These are Anello viridae. Anello is ring. Anello, which would be the last letters of my name, means actually goat. So I am a goat. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a Capricorn. That's a goat, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, it fits. <laughs> Perfect. 90% um, of humans have Anello viridae. They are small T equals one viruses, icosahedral capsids with a circular single-stranded genome of three to four KB. They infect many tissues. They can be found in your blood, saliva, urine, liver, kidney. They're transmitted by saliva from mother to the child. They're transmitted sexually, fecal, oral, and by blood transfusions. Uh, and they don't cause any pathology as far as we can tell. But if you are immunosuppressed, their levels go up. So they're in some kind of stasis with the immune system. Okay, let me see how much you remember. So that single-stranded DNA, when it gets in the nucleus, what has to happen first? It has to become double-stranded. Did you call it replication? It's repair, remember. It's not replication. Yes, it, well, it's not replication anyway. The cell sees it as single-stranded and says, not good, and we might not make it double-stranded, and then boom, once you're double-stranded, what can happen? mRNA can be made, exactly. You do remember some things. It's very gratifying. <laughs> it's very good. So those are an Um Then we have hepatitis B virus. Now these are all persistent virus infections. This one is not in all of you for good reason and because it can kill you. It is transmitted by exposure to blood at childbirth, if you get a blood transfusion using contaminated blood during sex, drug use, Tattooing, hospitals, if you're in a hospital, you can get hep B if they're not careful. And this is why every kid should get a hep B vaccine the week they're born. That's what we do now because there's so many opportunities for a child to get infected and the kids are the most susceptible to severe disease as you, as you will see in a moment. So, um, and if you, certainly if you're older and you didn't get it as a kid and you're working in a healthcare setting, you have to be in, vaccinated against hep B, right? If you're a nurse or a PA or a, or a physician or whatever, you need to have hep B. You wouldn't be allowed to work if, unless you get uh, vaccinated. Well, maybe nowadays you would be, who knows what, what goes on. But um, the target is the hepatocyte, as you could tell from the liver, he hepatitis is inflammation of the liver. 95% of adults resolve the infection. So if you got infected now, you, most of you would resolve it, but kids, see, only five to 10% can resolve infection. That's why we vaccinate them because they can't clear it and they go on to have a lifelong persistent infection. So uh, this is the, these are the numbers. I, I looked it up this morning and it's gone up since the last time I, I put this slide up. So it's now 297 million people, mainly in these countries with the dark colors. You can see Africa, uh, Asia, Western Pacific and so forth, over 6 million children less than five years of age. And there are 800,000 deaths a year globally caused by hep B. So this is a serious problem and uh, vaccination can help, but of course many countries simply don't vaccinate. So here's the pathogenesis. There are two forms of hep, hepatitis B. There's acute and chronic. So the acute form on the left, you get exposed and then we're looking at weeks post-exposure, and then there are a lot of different things assayed here. Here's hepatitis viral DNA, right? So this peaks about, I don't know, 10 weeks post-exposure, then slowly goes down. Look, it takes a year to clear it, but eventually you do clear it. The hepatitis B protein, so the surface antigen goes up and peaks more or less with the DNA, and we make antibodies to viral proteins. But the one I wanna point out to you is this this black one here, this is alanine uh, transferase. This is a liver enzyme. It's not supposed to be in the blood. It's, it's contained in the liver, but when you get liver damage, 
the, the, the enzyme ends up in the blood. So you can take blood from people and measure ALT, and that, that's a sign of hepatitis or liver damage. So you see, you have a peak of ALT in the blood, and then it goes down as the virus goes away. So the, the infection's cleared. That's great. And the symptoms are more or less around the peak of viral replication. The symptoms include jaundice, right? Yellow skin, yellow eyes, and so forth. And then on the right is chronic hepatitis. So again, weeks post exposure, you see very similar things going on, except they don't go to baseline anymore. The DNA stays around, the ALT remains elevated, the antigens remain elevated as well. And so this happens in 5% of adults, this chronic picture, and most children, if they're infected less than a year of age, they will undergo this chronic um, picture. Alanine transaminase is ALT, sorry. I don't know if I said that. So the, interestingly, the virus is not killing hepatocytes. It is the CTLs that are killing the hepatocytes. So the hepatitis is a form of immunopathology, but the T cells get exhausted at some point and they no longer function properly. And that's why the virus can persist because the, C the cells are no longer being eliminated. And so in a chronic infection in the life of the host, you have periods of destruction of the liver the T cells get exhausted, the liver regenerates, then the T cells come back and kill cells again. Then they get, you keep doing this over and over and this causes fibrosis of the liver, eventually <laughs> cirrhosis, liver failure, and then in some people, hepatocellular carcinoma, liver cancer, 20 to 30 years uh, after infection. And that's, that will be the cause of death. And you don't know that you have it until you have severe liver failure. Another hepatitis virus, is hepatitis C virus. So hep B, remember, is a DNA virus with a gapped DNA genome. Now hepatitis C virus is a flavivirus. It's a plus-stranded RNA virus. It is transmitted by exposure to contaminated blood. That can happen during sex, drugs use, tattooing, and during birth. We only discovered hep C in the 80s. You know, we first discovered hep A by realizing that we were giving people hep A by blood transfusions. So we discovered hep A and we tested blood for it and then they still got hepatitis and that led to B and then C and there's also delta and E as well. So we've made it, this is hepatitis alphabet soup. We've made it to E so far. And so C is, the, is a recent one, envelope virus. Here are the numbers. These have gone down actually and globally since I last updated this slide from 71 million to 58 million. But this is kind of um, a full sense of security because in many countries it's going up still. Um, 3.2 million adolescents and a million and a half new infections a year. The reasons it's going down is because we have great antivirals now for hep C. We do double and triple antiviral therapy and you can cure an infection. But, you know, people who get hep C, they will get it again, especially intravenous drug users. So they keep getting it over and over, they spread it to other people. So we do need a vaccine so that they would be permanently immune, but we don't have one yet. Here's the pathogenesis of uh, hepatitis C. So let's look at the top first, where we have, you're getting infected initially, and you have your acute infection, you have hepatitis, right? Raised ALT, just like hep B. We have jaundice, right? The liver is damaged and, you, and the, uh, the bilirubin is coloring you, your eyes in particular. Uh, this can be cleared in a number of people. Um, so, so between 10 and 40% recover from that infection and they have no more virus. They clear the infection. So it's just an acute infection. But uh, 60 to 90% of people go on to have a persistent infection where the virus is there and it's never cleared and you have other symptoms as well. And then after 30 years, um, you, some of these patients, 70 to 98% of them, most of them have uh, asymptomatic persistent infection for years, which you may think, well, that's great, but it's not great because they're gonna pass it to someone else, right? Because they have infectious virus. But two to 30% of those patients end up with end stage liver disease, right? With cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma, ascites and so forth. So a lot of deaths uh, from hep C. And these viruses persist by multiple immune modulation mechanisms that we 
you can imagine T cell antagonism and so forth. So here on the, here's the graph of the, of the infection. So we have establishment of infection here. On the left is the viral RNA and time after infection on the bottom in months. And on the right is ALT levels in the blood. So the red is the acute infection. So you have a period of uh, viral RNA peaking and then in a couple of months it's cleared and you have ALT peaking and it's cleared. Those are the people who clear the infection. Then the ones who go on for persistent infection, you can see the viral RNA in blue is never cleared. Uh, and um, ALTs you know, remained elevated, although they do go down from the acute level. So those are the, the persistent infections. Now the problem is here in the US, as you know, we have a opioid uh, epidemic, people using heroin, fentanyl, other opioids. You know, if you go and have surgery, your doctor will give you four tablets of opioid-based painkiller. And if you run out, they won't give you more because they're afraid you're gonna stockpile them and get addicted. That's what people do. It's really a problem. Anyway, the, uh, there's been an increase in people using these drugs, their injection, and um, as a consequence, hepatitis C has gone up from 2011 to 2016 because they're typically injected, the, the needles are not sterile, and they transmit hepatitis. So in the US, we've gone from 16,500 cases a year to 41,000 solely because of this uh, epidemic. So everything has a consequence, right? You know, in Egypt, um, what, what, when was it? Early in the 1900s, you know, they had a, they had a um, problem with schistosomiasis in Egypt. And so the government decided to inject everyone with an anti-schistosomiasis drug. And in, in the early 1900s, there were no plastic disposable needles. You had to use glass needles with, with uh, glass syringes with needles and you had to autoclave them. But uh, most of the time they didn't autoclave them. So they ended up giving hepatitis C to 70% of the Egyptian population as a consequence of this. And so we didn't know about hep C at the time. And now, you know, these people had hepatitis. And now in retrospect, we know it's the country with most hep C cases in the world because of that. And that's actually how HIV arose by the same kind of practice in Africa. We'll talk about that later. All right, next question is, which are shared features of persistent infections with polyomavirus, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C? Genomes are present, but not expressed. Liver damage, kidney damage, virus particles are produced, or all of the above. So what's in common among all of them? Okay, it's not gonna be 100. You see how long it's taking? <laughs> that's, it, that's it, we've made a correlation. So this, you guys are confused. I didn't explain this well, right? So let's see what we have here. I take full blame. Polyomavirus, hep B, and hep C. So what's common? Genomes are present but not expressed. No, that's not right, right? If you get infectious virus particles, you have to express the genome. So the polyomaviruses are making infectious virus as is hep B and C. So that's not right, even though a bunch of you got it. Liver damage, hep B and C, but remember polyomavirus, we don't, there's no damage in any tissue, so that's not right. A lot of you pick that one. Nobody picked kidney damage. And um, well, the answer is virus particles are produced in all of them, right? 
nothing else is in common. All right, now we're gonna to switch to um, different kinds, well, they're all persistent infections, but these are what we call latent infections, but don't be fooled by the name, it's just another persistent infection. Some general properties. So the virus genomes are present, but the viral proteins that help replicate the genomes are not made. Uh, the cells are poorly recognized by the immune system. And then the whole genome is present. So periodically you can make infectious virus and pass it on to a new host. So in contrast to the viruses we've talked about, the polyomas, Anella, Anelloviridae, Hep B and Hep C, there's always virus production there, right? So these are different because they're gonna be periods when there's no infectious virus production. And that's where the word latent comes from because there are periods when just the genome and maybe a few proteins are present, all right? That's important. So the genome can be a non-replicating DNA and a non-dividing cell. So herpes simplex and varicella zoster viruses uh, become established in neurons and they don't replicate because neurons don't replicate. No need to replicate. Sometimes these viruses are self-replicating in a dividing cell. Those are all viruses, herpes viruses, and we're putting in hep B as well there. And then finally, in one case, human herpes virus 6, the genome integrates, integrates into the host chromosome. So every time the host chromosome divides, so does that of the virus. So non-dividing DNA, autonomous DNA, which means it's the viral genome on its own and then integrated into the host chromosome. So let's start with herpes simplex viruses. Over 80% in the US are seropositive for herpes simplex viruses with genomes in your peripheral nervous system. So not your brain, not your spinal cord, but the, the ganglia outside of the nervous system, the, the central nervous system contain viral genomes. Millions of people have genomes in their nervous system without any symptoms whatsoever. About 40 million people have recurrent herpes disease, which means cold sores. They can be oral or anogenital cold sores. You know, HSV1 is primarily an oral pathogen, HSV2 primarily uh, genital, but they can be mixed up from time to time, but they can cause uh, sores as we'll see in a moment. So periods, periods where you see nothing, and then periods where you're seeing a cold sore, and that's when the virus is replicating and spreading to another person. So it's a well-adapted pathogen so that it's mostly benign. In fact, many people don't experience any disease and they're still uh, infected. So here's the pathogenesis. The virus you acquire, you can get it in utero from your mother, or you can get it shortly during birth, or you can get it in your early years it's transmitted by saliva, so if your parents like to kiss you, they'll give you herpes, right? Um, and the virus will be in saliva, will go into your mouth and infect the uh, epithelial cells lining your mouth. There's the epidermis there, and there's virus particles infecting it. And then the virus enters nerve endings, sensory nerves, of course, below the, the, the surface there, are transported to the uh, neuron cell body, uh, and then they can become latent. And where these cell bodies are, we'll see uh, in a moment. These, these are primary acute infections. Sometimes they're in a parent. Sometimes you can have fever, sore throat, ulcers, and so forth uh, in, in the baby. And then they, they go away, and you don't see those uh, any longer. Um, and then here's a, a schematic of what's happening. Here's our epithelial cell sheet, highly stylized, three cells. The virus has... Uh, passed through them, has entered the nerve ending, and makes its way into a ganglia. So here's a ganglia. It's a collection of neurons, right? There's one shown in prominence, and then there's a lot of neurons in the back there. And so the genome is in the nucleus of the neuron. It's silenced. It's not making any mRNAs, and it's coated with nucleosomes, and that's part of the silencing mechanism. There are multiple copies of the viral DNA. It's separate from the host chromosome. So there's no need for that DNA to replicate because neurons don't divide, right? So that's good. And um, herpes is for, unlike love, herpes is forever. <laughs> My favorite saying, you cannot get rid of it. If you go to YouTube, you'll see in the herpes lecture, you'll see people saying, I was cured by Dr. So-and-so. You go check out his or her cure. Nope, you can't be cured. Maybe one day you can remove it with CRISPR. I doubt it, but people would like to get rid of it. But right now you cannot cure it. I had moderators go through all my lectures and purge it of all that and they just came back. 
persistent comments, right? Drugs and vaccines, you can, if you get a fever sore, you can treat it with a drug, an antiviral, and it will make it go away quicker. But the latent genomes are still in your neurons. They do not go away, and that's the problem. In the neuron, we make, the, the virus actually is transcribed to make microRNAs. No proteins, no mRNAs, but microRNAs are made. It's from a, they're produced from a transcript called latency-associated transcript. No proteins are made from them, but we think they contribute to RNA silencing to maintain the genome in its latent state. But also, probably the host also contributes uh, to that as well. All right, so then reactivation, which means we're gonna produce some infectious virus because if the genome is staying in one person, it's never gonna survive as a virus. That's the end of the line. It has to spread to other people. Um, small numbers at any one time, given some stress, small numbers of neurons uh, reactivate. We'll talk about the stress, I think, on the next slide. And the, the, the genome is expressed and virus particles are made in the neuron and they travel by anterograde transport to the epithelial cell sheet and the virus then infect the sheet and reproduce in the epithelium. And then you can get a, a, a cold sore or a blister or not, but then you shed infectious virus and that's how it's transmitted. And the immune response is too slow coupled with viral antagonism to prevent this shedding. So, you know, this can happen relatively quickly. It takes a few days for the memory response to kick in, and plus the virus is antagonizing responses. So that's enough time for virus to be made and transmit to another person. Then the virus infection gets shut down, you return to latency, but by then it's already spread. And some people reactivate every two, three weeks. Some of them have cold sores every two, three weeks, some of them don't. And some people actually never reactivate. Um, why that is, is, isn't clear. So for herpes, that you acquire in your buccal mucosa, in your mouth, the epithelium, it becomes latent in the trigeminal ganglia. These are two ganglia on either side of your head, just in front of your ear, that where all the neurons that innervate different parts of your face are, are, are collecting. As you can see there, there are neurons, in your forehead, your nose, your cheeks, and also your lips. So you can actually get cold sores anywhere. Many people get them on the nose or primarily on the lip. As the virus comes out of the ganglia, it goes down the nerve and infects the epithelial cell sheet. So the kinds of stresses that lead to reactivation, sunburn, many people go skiing and then they have a herpes cold sore a few, few weeks after, or a few days after that. Physical or emotional stress, midterms can reactivate your herpes virus. If you have nerve damage of some kind, hormonal imbalances, steroids, so this stress stimulates the production of the proteins needed to do the transcription. Remember, this is the transcriptional program of herpes simplex virus. But you know you have to make all the early, immediate early, early, and late proteins, right? The, the early proteins are the replication proteins and the late encode the structural proteins. But remember, this is the conundrum. The particle brought in VP16, which allows the immediate early promoter to function but there's no particles here. You, ha you have to make them. So how do you get this going? How do you, for years, people didn't understand how you, how you got reactivation from just the DNA genome because you need VP16 to get it to be transcribed. Do you see that? Okay, but here's the answer. It's very cool. So the genome is present in the ganglia wrapped in chromatin and it is um, methylated on various parts of the histone, and that keeps it silent. The methylation of the histone proteins keeps the DNA from being transcribed. When you, under, when you have stress, all these stresses I told you about, what they do is they activate neuronal kinases. Those kinases phosphorylate um, some of these histone proteins. Here's one of them, J and K kinase, and it his, it, it's phosphorylating histone three serine 10, the P means phosphorylation. And that phosphorylation can partially reverse the repressive effect of the histone methylation. So you can get transcription of all the viral classes, immediate, early, early, and late, just by phosphorylating the histone. You don't need VP16, for, apparently. So that solves the problem. And then uh, the histone demethylases take off the, the methyls, and then you get full-blown 
uh, transcription and then production of viral proteins and virus particles as you see here. So that, that's what we think is happening uh, during reactivation. And I just warn you, we have no clue how it works for the other herpes viruses that we're gonna talk about in a bit. All right, the next question is, uh, persistence of herpes simplex virus and nerve ganglia requires which of the following? Continuous episomal DNA replication, low level production of virions, that's an infectious virus, silencing of all gene expression except lat and microRNA, UV light stress, steroids, all of the above. So what do you need for persistence? All right, let's, let's have a look. <clears throat> Yeah, it's not very good, is it? 50% got it. Of, silencing of gene expression except Latin microRNA. That's, that is um, what is required for persistence. DNA replication. Remember, the DNA doesn't have to replicate. It's in a neuron. It's a non-dividing cell. Yet, 26% of you picked that. But so to you, I say, it's a neuron. It does not divide. The viral genome doesn't have to replicate. It's, remember, it's persistence. It's not reactivation that I'm asking you here. Low level production of virions, no. There's no, only microRNA and LATs are produced. Uh, UV light stress or steroids reactivates, but doesn't cause persistence, okay? Epstein-Barr virus, another herpes virus. Uh, a lot of US adults, seropositive, 95% are seropositive, all of us pretty much, and we carry the, the genome in lymphocytes, B lymphocytes is the reservoir for this, so not ganglia. And most of us are infected at an early age. Many people go to college and are still seronegative or enter the armed forces actually and are seronegative and then they become seropositive because with all the other people around, they're more likely to uh, acquire it. It causes infectious mononucleosis when you first have that acute infection. You can have mononucleosis where you feel very tired, um, but it typically resolves. But then because it's latent, the virus is around forever and it can cause other problems, cancers, Hodgkin's lymphoma, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, and Burkitt's lymphoma can be caused by EBV. So here's the pathogenesis. Again, you acquire it from typically saliva from your parents or from someone else. Um, here it is infecting the epithelial layer. It passes through the layer and then infects a B cell that's underneath that basement membrane. It causes the B cell to differentiate actually into a memory cell, which is a long-lived cell, and then the genome is in the memory cell. It's a brilliant strategy, right? You, because a B cell alone is not gonna be long-lived, but a memory B cell is long-lived. Uh, and so then these are around forever, basically. They can reside in various lymphoid tissues, even the bone marrow. And periodically, they become reactivated. So they express a few viral proteins. So the viral DNA is in there in this B cell, memory B cell. But uh, it's making viral proteins, LMP1, 2, and EBNOS. These are all viral proteins. So it's very different from uh, herpes simplex, where no viral proteins are made. But a, a reduced repertoire, and periodically, these cells reactivate. We don't know what the stimulus is. They begin to make virus particles, which can then uh, pass through the epithelial cell layer in the other direction and infect uh, other people. But B cells are essential for latency of this virus. So the DNA is self-replicating. However, what there is, what's it, what is of interest now that you ask is that these, um, these EBNA proteins that are made, Epstein, Barr virus, nuclear antigen, they're in the nucleus. You make antibodies against them and those antibodies cross-react with the neuronal protein, and so that results in MS in a certain fraction of people. So EBV is a big factor for having MS, interestingly. But it's not every MS case, but it's a big, it's a big one, and many papers have just been published on that. It's really interesting. Part of the problem was we couldn't, everybody had EBV, so how would you know if a virus causes anything if everyone has it, right? But the key was the army who saves everybody's blood when they go in the army, then they take it every year and store it. So they had people who were EBV seronegative upon recruitment. They watched them seroconvert to EBV positivity, and then they watched a fraction of them get MS, and they made these antibodies against the brain protein. So it's just amazing what you can do when you have so many people in an institutional setting like that and you collect specimens from them. It's really solved the problem. 
Uh, so the DNA is self-replicating because B cells do replicate, so it has to replicate with them. And as I said, a limited repertoire of viral genes are expressed. These memory B cells go to the bone marrow and other lymphoid organs, and that's where they remain uh, latent. And um, when they reactivate, they can be killed by, by CTLs or antibody, but the virus antagonizes that response sufficiently so that it can make enough virus to spread to another person. And then the infection is, is limited, and, but you still have memory B cells which have the viral genome, so that's why it lasts forever in you. And you have periodic episodes of reactivation. The other herpes virus, or one of the next herpes viruses, is varicella zoster virus. This is two different diseases in the name. Varicella is chicken pox, and zoster is a rash disease that you get many years later. So this is transmitted uh, by respiratory droplets, ver very much like you know, HSV and EBV, infects the upper respiratory tract. Uh, but this one makes a viremia, reproduces in multiple organs, and then eventually the virus goes to the skin and you get this rash appearance typical of chickenpox, which now you, there is a vaccine to prevent this. Um, when I was a kid, there wasn't, and I, had, I remember distinctly having chickenpox, having a rash everywhere. The virus then becomes um, latent in sensory ganglia, right? Just, so just below the skin where these lesions are, the virus enters sensory neurons very much like herpes simplex, but this can be in any part of the body, not just the ganglia of the, around the head, for example. Uh, and the viruses remain latent there. And then many years later, typically when you're 50 or older, so you've had chicken pox as a kid, you're 50 or older, suddenly you get this incredible itchy rash. This is on someone's uh, abdomen here. And it's, it's in a line which corresponds to innervation by a specific set of uh, sensory neurons. So the virus is reactivated, it's released from the nerve termini and reproduces in the skin, you get this rash. You can treat this with uh, antivirals as well. So this, um, before vaccine, everybody got infected with VZV, 99% of adults, 30% of them got zoster 50 years or so later. This virus DNA is episomal and it replicates um, on its own in, 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 when it has to, when, it, when it's coming out of the neurons. Uh, but before that, of course, it remains um, non-replicating until it needs to make new virus particle. And just like EBV, you have restricted viral gene expression, very much less restricted than herpes simplex virus. We don't know what triggers reactivation from neurons. So now if you, none of you, this doesn't apply to any of you, but people of my generation who had chicken pox to prevent shingles, there's now a shingles vaccine. And so you can get that and it will prevent you from having this shingles. And that vaccine is so good, it's called Shingrix, it's probably gonna replace the childhood chickenpox vaccine. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Cytomegalovirus is another herpes virus with high prevalence globally transmitted by respiratory roots, saliva, urine, sex, and it replicates in white blood cells and endothelial cells. Here's a seropositivity graph. Of, uh, so here we have CMV, IgG, seroprevalence in percent on the y-axis and on the x-axis, age and years. So you can see six to 14 years of age, we already have 50% seroprevalence. And then as you go up in age, you, you get higher and higher seroprevalence. Uh, this virus, um, again, it's, there's a primary infection, is usually a, a acute infection, asymptomatic or free, febrile mono-like illness. You shed virus persistently in the saliva and urine for months to years after that primary infection. Eventually, that infection is resolved, but you have latently infected myeloid cells. And these are in the bone marrow. They're precursors to monocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells. So here is the, the development of the immune cells. There's a multipotential hematopoietic stem cell at the, at the top. Remember, we talked about that. It's self-renewing. That gives rise to lymphoid progenitors and myeloid progenitors. So CMV becomes latent in the myeloid progenitor and ends up in monocytes and macrophages. The real problem with CMV, well, there are two problems. One is in transplant recipients. When you immunosuppress someone who got an organ, you often make CMV replicate like crazy. So you have to be ready with antivirals because everyone has CMV. There's no way that you're gonna get an organ that's CMV free and you're gonna be CMV infected yourself. But the real issue is um, pregnant women. If you get infected 
while you're pregnant, you can, the, the virus can reproduce in the fetus and cause severe multi-organ congenital defects and even death. So here are the numbers. So we have 1,000 pregnancies that leave, lead to live birth. So 400 women don't have CMV before pregnancy. Uh, most of them don't get CMV during their pregnancy, but seven do, so seven out of 1,000 do, and two give birth to CMV positive babies uh, with permanent problems. And then we have women who already have CMV and uh, they have babies that are fine. Five, most of them have babies that are fine, but six have CMV positive babies and one to two have permanent problems. So um, this, is, this is why CMV is a, is a continuing problem. All right, our last question. Uh, what do persistent infections with EBV, VZV, and CMV have in common? B cells are essential for latent infection may cause congenital birth defects. Viral DNA persists as an episome. The factors governing reactivation are well known, all of the above. All right, let's have a look. All right, 21, good. Let's see, much better. Yeah, viral DNA persists as an episome is what they have in common. B cells are essential only for EBV. Congenital birth defects is caused by CMV. The, facting, the factors governing reactivation are well known for what virus? Herpes. Remember the cool reactivation. And I purposefully said, this is the only one that's well known, but obviously none of you listen to me. <laughs> that's okay. You can hear it later. Yeah, so it's uh, viral DNA persists as an episode. Uh, okay, the last herpes virus is herpes six and seven. These are two her recently discovered herpes viruses that cause a mild childhood rash called sixth disease or exanthem subitum. So the first infection, you can see, you get this rash all over the child. So everybody gets infected. Over 85% of, of uh, adults have antibodies and the, the transmission is by respiratory secretions from parent to child. It affects multiple cell types and it becomes latent in monocytes and macrophages and, and hematopoietic Pre precursors as, as for CMV, and then HHV7 in uh, CD4 positive lymphocytes. So this is a virus, again, that stays with you forever and is periodically reactivated to spread to someone else. The interesting aspect of this virus is that for HHV6, the genome integrates into the telomere of the chromosome. You all know what telomeres are, right? The ends of the chromosome and with repeated sequences. And HSV6 integrates into those in about 1% of infections, not everyone. So here's the telomeric region of the human chromosome, the red stripes, and here's the viral genome. It's got sequences that are homologous to the telomeres uh, at either end of the genome, and this integrates into the host cell, and then you get HHV6 just stuck on the end of uh, the chromosome. And so then it's, it's typically in the germline, so you parents pass it on to their kids and it reactivates and they can get this rash disease. So it's an interesting strategy for, for not just latency, but also transmission to another host. But again, it's not every infection, it's just about 1%. I wanna end with this slide, which is a estimated burden of chronic viral infections in humans. So on the, on the y-axis, we have the estimated number of infected individual in millions, and then different viruses on the x-axis. So these are some of these viruses we've talked about. Endogenous retroviruses, right? We all have endogenous retroviruses in our genome, so that's everybody that far. And look at all these other viruses that are really close. You know, the Anello viruses that I told you about, uh, HHV6 and 7, VZV, EBV, CMV, polyoma viruses, herpes viruses, and then, you know, we get into Hep B and Hep C, the numbers start to go down. Here's HIV here. Um, but basically, all of us have at least a dozen chronic infections, probably more. So why is this in of interest? Let's say you're studying diabetes and you want to know what's causing diabetes in people. You never have a virus negative population. How do you know the virus, all these viruses are not contributing to it? And when people design studies, they never take this into account. With EBV, 
they got smart and they picked people before they turned seropositive because they were going into the, the armed forces. And so what I want to leave you with is if you ever do a clinical trial where you want to know what causes something, don't ignore the virome. It might make a contribution. We saw that with EBV for sure. Okay, next time we're going to talk about how viruses transform cells and make them oncogenic.